give me the thumbs up. Ready? Hello, we want to welcome you. Uh, we've already had church. <laughs> we've already had a good time, but we're in 1 Corinthians right now, and uh, we will continue to. 1 Corinthians 14, and uh, we've already used a lot of time, so I'm going to be um, a little quick on a couple things. But 1 Corinthians 14, and the thing that God's really laid on my heart, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 40, it says, let all things be done decently and in order. Now, um, let all things be done decently and in order. Now, if you look at the context of this verse, it's talking about the gifts of the Spirit. Okay, It's talking about allowing the gifts of the Spirit to be done decently in order in the church. But the thing that I want to bring out when I feel like God's laying on my heart is how many know that God is a God of order? Now, a lot of times when you talk a lot about freedom... You know, and you start talking about order in the church, people are like, ugh, order, that's gross. What are you talking about? But, but here's the thing. True freedom is in a place of order. And what I want to talk to you about this morning is priorities. How many know that your life is lived and experienced through the priorities that you have in your heart? How many of you've got things that are very important in your life, a little bit less important, a little bit less? Everybody in here, you have priorities. You have things in your life that you prioritize above other things. And our God wants our priorities to be healthy. How many know you can have your priorities off? And you can be making something really important that really shouldn't be. And when your priorities are off, things don't flow correctly uh, in your life the way that, uh, the way that God and um you know, and I'm talking about let everything be done decently in order. How many know God is a God of order? How many know there was a first day? And there were things that were made on the first day. There was a second day. And there were things that were made on the second day. Third day, fourth day, fifth day. God didn't make what was supposed to be on the first day. He didn't make it on the fifth day or the sixth day, right? He had an order and he had a way that he did it. And in our lives, um, there are certain ways that we are to prioritize things. Now, let's um, turn to Matthew chapter 6. Because, you know, where I came from, you know, the church that I used to serve in, um, our priorities were really, really off. And because of that, it affected everything in our lives in a very negative way. And the way Matthew um, chapter 6, and the way that we did things, is this, this is the way our priorities were set. Number one was your church, was ministry, Okay? That was number one. Your church was more important than your family. Your church was more important than your job. Your church was more important than your marriage. Your church was more important than your personal calling. Your church was the most important thing in your life. And so people put their church above their marriage. People put their church above their children. People put their church above their job. Now, here, here, here's the challenge with that. And, 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 and because a healthy priority... How many know God is first in your life? For God to be first is a healthy thing. But you have to understand that, that, that your relationship with God is bigger than your church. You don't hear a lot of pastors say that. It's not real popular, but um, it's true. I mean, no, your church is not your relationship with God. You should have a relationship with God outside of your church. And so the number one thing in your life is this, is your relationship with God. Now, when I'm talking about your relationship with God, I'm not talking about you doing anything for God. I'm talking about you receiving from God. Receiving from God is number one. And, you know, when we see it, and people, we, we share this a lot, and this is one of the things God's doing in the body of Christ, I mean, you know that Martha and Mary had two different priorities. I mean, you know, Martha was more concerned about serving Jesus, and Mary was more concerned about receiving from Jesus. Everybody familiar with Martha and Mary? Martha was, you know, running around the house and trying to cook the food and trying to prepare everything for Jesus. She was trying to give to Jesus. How many of you know that's noble? How many of you know that's awesome? But, but Jesus, 
uh, turned to Martha and says, Mary has chosen, one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen it. How many know Mary wasn't there to serve Jesus? Mary was there to receive from Jesus. How many know Mary sat down at his feet and heard his word? How many know Mary was receiving? She was not in a giving mode. She was not in a serving mode. She was in a receiving mode. And Jesus says, it's more important for you to receive from him than to give to him. It's the truth. Because, you know, as a pastor, you know, one of the things I have to be careful of is because I'm doing a lot of ministry now and, 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 and preaching here and, and finishing this book and, and preaching out. And how many know that you could say we were all sitting in here and we were all having like a, we were all eating and having a dinner or something. And I ran to the back and was just constantly giving out water to everybody, constantly giving out water, constantly giving out water. How many know I could starve to death and die of dehydration giving other people water? If I never drink myself, and I think a lot of people in ministry, they're so consumed with serving the Lord and giving to the Lord and even giving to the Lord's people that they don't drink from the Lord. And I'm here to tell you right now, you know, you're, you, you're, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. And your, your primary job and my primary job is to receive the love of God. To receive. Everybody say receive. receive. See, we've come out of a, time, a period in Christianity where Christianity was about achieving. Christianity, and we, we were, we're going to achieve, we're going to do, we're going to, we know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, and, and we, were, we come out of this achieving mode, and, and the challenge is, if the focus is on achieving, we will end up in our own strength. We will end up frustrated, and we will end up failing. And your, your primary calling, you know, Jesus told Mary, one thing is needful. And it's not, how I many know Jesus did not stop Mary from receiving from him? Can I get an amen? He didn't tell her what she was doing was wrong. Because here's the thing. How I many know that at the time, that meal wasn't that big of a deal? Martha prioritized the meal above receiving from Jesus. Are y'all tracking me here? How I many know Martha's uh, priorities were off? How I many know Jesus can cook his own dinner? Give him, give him a couple of fish and a piece of bread, and he can feed 5,000 people. Can I get an amen? He's got it. Now, please understand, I'm not being critical towards Martha because... Listen to me. She had her motivation was beautiful. Her heart was beautiful, but her priorities were off. And because her priorities were off, she ended up being frustrated. How many know when the time came that Jesus actually needed someone to minister to him? How many know Mary was there? Mary was right there to minister to Jesus when he needed it. You know why? Because when the time was for Mary to receive. She received, so she actually had something to give. When it was time to give. Who are the greatest givers in the body of Christ? The greatest givers in the body of Christ are the greatest receivers. I mean, you cannot give what you don't have. And so Mary uh, prioritized receiving from Jesus above serving Jesus and because of that, when, it, when Jesus actually needed ministry, how many know there's a time? How many know Mary's at the foot of the cross? How many know Mary came and anointed him for his burial? It was, she was not being lazy, but her priorities were right. And she was exalting, receiving from him above giving to him. You know, and you see it in Peter and John's life, and we talk about this a lot, but Peter boasted in his love for the Lord. And when, it, when, when, and when it was time to serve Jesus, how I many know Peter was nowhere? In, the, in, in Jesus' greatest moment of need, uh, Peter denied him three times and cussed him because Peter didn't cuss Jesus, but cussed. Peter was, was all about showing Jesus what he could do. And whereas John would never boasted in how much he loved Jesus, John was always boasting in how much Jesus loved him. How I many you know John was in a mode of receiving? John had a grace-based relationship. Man, Jesus loves me. Here's the thing, folks. How many you know Jesus loves everybody in here right now? But there are varying levels and degrees of us understanding how much He loves us. Can I get an amen? Everybody in here, there's different levels of you understanding that love. Now, how many you know He loves all of us the same? 
But you've got to personalize it to enjoy it. You've got to make it real. You've got to receive it for you so that you can enjoy it. How many know when you're aware of God's love, you're fearless? When you're aware of God's love, you're not, the challenge is your faith. Man, God loves me. Let me tell you something even deeper than that. Temptation has no power over you when you know you're loved. Temptation becomes unattractive in the presence of His love. Temptation becomes attractive when we feel rejected. And we don't feel appreciated and we don't feel like we're loved. And so, in the church that I, that I, that I was in, we put the church first, and then we put you know, our marriages down here, our children down here, and then ultimately our relationship with God was below the church. Now, how many know that that can look honorable outwardly? Well, man, we're, we're in church six days a week. I'm reading my Bible, I'm witnessing, I'm giving, I'm doing this, and I'm doing this, and I'm, 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 And outwardly, it can look wonderful, but how many know inwardly there's something wrong? There's something sick. There's something broken. There, there's a priority that's off. And so, for us, and so for me, I mean, I've spent a many, many years of my life like that, and I saw what happens to people when they put their church before their families. I saw what happens to people when they put their church before their marriage, before their children. And I'm here to tell you right now, it's not good. It's unhealthy. And so the, the important thing to understand here is this. Serving God is not the same thing as receiving from Him. Number one most important thing in your life is your relationship with God. And that relationship with God that you have is you receiving from Him. Can I get an Amen. How many know when you worship Him, you're not worshiping Him for you? That's right. Excuse me, that's wrong. <laughs> Sorry. When you're worshiping Him, you're not, you're not worshiping Him for Him. Yeah. You're worshiping Him for you. Yeah. Sorry about that. Because, I mean, when we worship Him, we're the ones that are strengthened. Now, He enjoys our worship, don't get me wrong. But when we spend time with Him, we're the ones that are actually receiving. We're the ones that are being strengthened. We're the ones that are benefiting from it. Amen? And so... Number one thing in your life is your relationship with God, and that is you receiving from Him. Now, in Matthew chapter 6, and we take a look here at uh, verse 33. It says, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And so, right here, we are, we are given a, um, a seek first. Everybody say first. So right here, God is laying out, this is something that's first, this is something important. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Well, if you turn to Romans 14, you don't have to turn there for sake of time, but it says the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Now, here's the thing. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? Well, here it is. How many know that you right now, the kingdom of God is within you? It's on the inside of you, Right? You've been born again. Jesus is living on the inside of you. The kingdom of God is within you. And so what happens is this. Folks, your righteousness, this gift of righteousness that has been given to you, it is paramount importance that you understand that you are the righteousness of God. And we, we preach that a lot here because it's so important. Because if you don't understand you're the righteousness of God and you're, you're experiencing condemnation, everything else is going to be off. I'm talking everything else is going to be off. Because if, if, you, if, you're, if you're under condemnation, the good works that you do won't be good works, they'll be dead works. What are you talking about? Because if, if you're, you're trying to do something good for somebody, it's not because you love them, it's because you're trying to get right with God. And so you're doing a good work here and you're doing a good work there, and the whole time you're, 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 you're trying to feed this unfeedable monster called a guilty conscience. Your guilty conscience will not be satisfied with good works. I don't care how many pats on the back you get. I don't care how many pastors tell you you're awesome. How many leaders tell you you're awesome. Your guilty conscience, it's like a, it's like a Furby. <laughs> you feed it and it grows and it grows and it grows and it grows. You know, you can see it. I mean, you know, in Martin, Luther, Martin Luther's life, I mean, you know, he had the most guilty conscience in the world. One of them. But to about Martin Luther uh, back in the 1500s. I mean, he was, he was crawling upstairs. And, you know, putting out broken glass 
trying to appease this God that he did not know. And the priest hated to see Martin Luther come around because he confessed sin for hours. Not that he had sinned a bunch, but that his conscience, he felt so guilty and so scared, and his conscience, his sin consciousness was so developed, the priest hated seeing him coming. So they're like, oh Lord, here comes Martin Luther. He's going to confess his sin and bless God. I want to eat lunch today. <laughs> and, and my point being, um, how many know no amount of good works is going to bring, not good works, dead works, is going to, make your, is going to satisfy your conscience? In fact, the more you do, the less you believe. And then all of a sudden, Martin Luther had this epiphany, the just shall live by faith, or the just are made right with God through faith. And how many know all of a sudden, this brother got free? All the fear, all the shame, all the guilt, all the dead works were gone, and he stood up and boldly declared, I'm right with God because I believe. And that's when the Reformation was born, and we're still feeling the effects of it today. Now, did, did, now as, how many know all of a sudden, his conscience is now satisfied because he was seeking first the kingdom of God. His righteousness. Can I get an amen? You've got to understand that you're the righteousness of God. Amen. And you're the righteousness of God apart from your good works. Apart from the deeds of the law. You are the righteousness of God because you believe in Jesus. He that knew no sin became sin so that you could become the righteousness of God in him. Ladies and gentlemen, it's important for you to understand. Jesus is your righteousness. Everybody say that with me. Say, I am... The righteousness of God. I'm right with God. Not because of what I've done, but because of what Jesus did. Folks, that, that's the foundation of the kingdom within you. And when condemnation uh, begins to arise in your heart, it's not time to try to do a thousand things to make yourself feel better. It's time to get your eyes on the cross. It's time to get your eyes on Jesus. Now, so seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. All these things will be added unto you. When you understand that you're righteous, I mean, all of a sudden your heart is filled with what? Peace. All of a sudden, you're flooded with peace. You know why you're flooded with peace? Because you're right with God, and you know that God's on your team, and God's on your side. Hallelujah. Amen. And then out of that place of peace, immediately comes something called joy. I mean, when you know that you're right with God, and you know that God's on your team, you're happy. No matter how bad the fiery trial, no matter how bad the challenge is, as long as you know that God is for you, you're good to go. And here's the reality. God is for you. Can you get an amen? amen? You've never, God is for you, God is for you, God is for you, God is for you. When you, God is for you. He's on your team, He's on your side. And so God prioritizes, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness above everything else because if you don't understand that God is for you and you don't understand that you're the righteousness of God, you're going you're to live a really bad Christian life. Because you're going to live your life trying to appease the conscience that you cannot appease. And unfortunately, when your own conscience is feeling guilty, how many of you are always looking to other people for approval? And as you're looking to other people for approval, you know what ends up happening to you? You never find it. <laughs> Can I get an amen? Can you please everybody? Absolutely not. And instead of being a Christian, you turn into a politician. And you are trying, not to say that we can't have Christian politicians. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is, how many know you don't need somebody's vote for your approval? And see, the fear of man is a snare. So when Christians have a guilty conscience and they're not established in righteousness, they run around trying to get their approval from other people. You know what happens? It sets them up for manipulation. It sets them up to be used and to be, to be manipulated. How many know that is not freedom? So, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. All these things will be added unto you. Now, 1 Timothy chapter 3, please. Number one is your relationship with God and understanding what Jesus has done on the work on the cross. That's number one. That's the most important thing. And now, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, now this is referring to people in ministry, but how many know we're all called to ministry? And we are all ministers. Just because not everybody has a five-fold ministry gift is not... I mean, we're all, we are all ministers of reconciliation. And so I just want to say this in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 4 it says, One who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence, for if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Now, what I want to show you right here is God prioritizes your family above your church. God prioritizes your family above your ministry. 
He says, if you don't know how to take care of your own house, then how are you going to take care of the house of God? Y'all tracking me here? And so my point being, your number one ministry is your family. Amen. Now, church should be a place where church blesses your family. And you come to church so that you can receive and so that you can have something to give. Amen. And, and, but the moment that someone's church becomes more important than their family, I mean, oh, it sets people up for failure. It's not a good thing. It's not a good thing at all. Your church was never, in God's eyes, to be more important than your family. Everybody understand that? See, to some of y'all, this may be a no-brainer. But to many of us, we came out of some stuff where the ministry was exalted above everything else. And what ends up happening is people's families suffer, their marriages suffer, their children suffer. And uh, it was never God's intention. Amen? And so, your family is next. Number one is your relationship with God. Amen? And then comes your family. Well, Jeremiah, is, is God going to call me to, to, to make sacrifices and things of that nature? How many know? Absolutely. How many know Jesus said there would be times when you, when you were serving the Lord when there would be sacrifices? You know, me being away from my family, it's not something I enjoy when I'm traveling and stuff. It's not something I, may, I, I enjoy, but at the same time, I know it's something that God has called me to do. And what I have found is God will take quantity and replace it with quality of time. How many know there's such thing as, as quality of time? How many know sitting in a room with someone watching TV with them for three hours and never talking to them is not really quality? Are y'all tracking me? How many know that's not really spending time together? It's really not. It's, too, if you, it's amazing to think that as Americans we could rewind our life and look and how, how much of it did we send staring at this, this tube? <laughs> Sitting around people we love but never really talking to them. No criticism because I watch TV too, but my point being is this, quality of time is greater than quantity of time. And when you have that quality time, uh, God will bring that into your life to bless you and to bless your family. But here's the thing, number one priority, your relationship with God. Number two, your family. Number three, your church, your ministry, your job. Are y'all tracking me here? And, and uh, now let's, let's, let's take it a step further here, and let's go to um, Luke chapter 12. When our priorities are right, things run smoothly, and when our priorities are wrong, no matter how hard we try, things don't run good. How many know Martha was really, really, really trying, but how many know she was really frustrated? And she ended up accusing the one that was actually serving God correctly. She told on her sister. <laughs> she got on her. Luke chapter 12. And um, and let's take a look here. This whole chapter is good. I mean, it's kind of hard to... Verse 22, Jesus talking. Then He said to His disciples, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor, nor about the body, what you will put on. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, barn, and God feeds them. And how much more value are you than the birds? Which of you, by worry, can add one cubit to a stature? If you then are not able to, to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I say unto you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. So then God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven. How much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have anxious, an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Now here's the thing. How many of this is huge? The enemy is always trying to make money the most important thing. To make money the primary priority. Now, how many know a lot of people, they spend their lives where money is the primary priority? 
Now here's the thing, and what, what God is teaching here right now, He's saying, you seek me above money. If you make money your number one priority, you will never be happy. If you, make no, if you make money your number one priority, what ends up happening is, is money becomes your Lord. Money becomes your God. And here's the thing. How many know money does not make a good God and does not make a good Lord? In fact, when money is your God, you spend your days in fear. Because you never feel like you're going to have enough. Now, and I make this statement. How many know there are plenty of, of quote, people that have plenty of money financially? But yet money is their God. And I'm here to tell you right now, they live in fear because they're always scared they're going to lose it. Because money becomes their, their God. And so an unhealthy worldly priority is to place money above God. And, it, and, it, and, it, and it always, it's always trying to lord over. It's always trying to be a God to... It is the God to the world. But it also tries to be a God to Christians. How many know God is bigger than money? And God says this to us, You seek Me first. You seek Me above money. And money will seek after you as you seek after Me. Can I get an Amen. Now, as I'm saying this, don't think I'm saying, well, Jeremiah said I'm supposed to seek God, I'm not supposed to work. I mean, you know, the Bible makes it very clear that we are to work. Makes it very clear that we are to work. And so I'm not saying that you don't work, but I'm saying this. How many know that you can have a job, but your job not be more important than your God? Can I get an amen? But the, but the, the enemy will always try to take money and scare people into submission with it and make money be more important than serving God. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I, my wife and I, we have never made our decisions in serving God based on finances. Never. Years and years and years and years and years ago, God told us to, to quit our jobs and go into full-time ministry when there was no paycheck. And for two solid years, we did full-time ministry with no paycheck. But God told us to do it. And because God told us to do it, how I many know God supplied our needs? Never missed a meal. Never missed a bill. Only had one thing cut off the entire time. I had a phone, a phone cut off, and that was only because I had missed a phone call. But other than that, now, I mean, it was a challenge, because as soon as we did that, my wife got pregnant. As soon as we quit our job, she immediately got pregnant. But God told me to put my hand to the plow and never look back. That's been over 10 years now. And so during that two-year period of time where we had no paycheck coming in, all of a sudden, how I many know oh, my priorities were rearranged tremendously? And it did a work in me because it made me realize this, God is going to take care of Jeremiah Johnson one way or the other. Because I wasn't, and what happened? God just, you know, and at that time we were given 30% of everything that came in. Two. But listen, folks, I, I don't say that to try to tell other people to do that. I'm just telling you what God told us to do. This is what He told us to do. And He supplied our needs the entire time. But one of the things that I was being set free from was money being my God. And it's healthy for all of us to recognize this. God is bigger than money. God is above money. We seek God first, and then money will fall into place where it's supposed to be. But I'm here to tell you, if you put money above God, you will never have enough. You can never work enough hours. You will never have enough. And you'll stay in that place of fear. How I many know oh, God doesn't want money to be your Lord? He doesn't want money to be your God. And I know anytime you talk about money, it's a sensitive subject. But how I many know oh, that we should be able to, in church, talk about Him? So that we don't have to allow it to lord over us. How many know money's not the number one priority? How many know it's not number two? It's not number three. How many know money's not more important than your family? Can't get an amen. If, if money's not, how many know money's not more important than your marriage or more important than your children? I have met people <coughs> who have plenty of finances, and instead of spending time with their kids, they just buy stuff for their kids. And what ends up happening is there's not a real relationship that's developed, and it's almost like a guilty payoff. 
Y'all tracking me here? It's quiet in this charismatic church. <laughs> but the point being, how I many know God in one moment can rearrange our priorities and make it to where He's first? Talking about receiving from Him being first. Relationship with Him being first. Amen. He's first. Is He first? Is it a healthy life when He's first? But you got to remember it and you got to differentiate between receiving from Him and serving Him. How many of you know it's good to serve the Lord? How many of you know there are rewards for, for serving the Lord? In this life and in the next life. There are rewards for it. And so serving the Lord is good, but replacing serving the Lord with relationship with Him is very unhealthy. Amen? So number one is receiving from the Lord. Uh, number two um, is your family. Then number three... Uh, ranks out at your, you know, your job and your, and, your, and your ministry and your church and things of that nature. I mean, you know, if you take your job and put it above your family, it's not healthy. If you take your job and put it above your God, it's not healthy. Can I get an amen? It's the truth. And so what God wants to do is He wants to tweak our priorities because how many know it's real easy for those priorities to slip out of place and put money first? Because we live in a world that requires money to live in. Y'all tracking me here this morning? How many know Jesus is first? Receiving from Him. Amen? And when I'm saying that, I'm not saying your church is first. Understand that. Because in times past, that we would equate God and church being the same exact thing. And then what, I mean, then what ends up happening is, well, you know, this is your church, and you need to put your church before your own well-being. I mean, oh, that's wrong. That's not right. If your church is your church is not above your church is not before your own well being. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. And it's funny because once I see people come out of legalism, they start getting a hold of grace. All of a sudden, people feel like they don't have to be in church all the time. You know, as a pastor, that can be a challenge because you want people to come to church, you want people to learn. But how many know if it, Controlling people and loving people is not the same thing. It's a, can I get an amen? You've got to give people the freedom to live their life. And sometimes when people come out of legalism, it's like they take some time and they spend some time with their family that they ain't never spent before. And it's, it, it is a healthy and good thing for them. And the pastor is going to have to trust God. See, when you preach this gospel, that's when you really trust God. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. Because you no longer control anything. You don't control anything. You just preach the gospel and you trust God and get that God's going to take care of things. Amen? And that's one of the reasons I think so many pastors are scared to preach the gospel because they spent their entire lives building their kingdom with their own hands and all of a sudden they're going to have to trust God to bring forth fruit rather than them uh, trying to choreograph and manipulate and get a desired result. But what God, when the, when the gospel comes in, it, it re evaluates and reorientates all of our priorities and gets things straight. Amen? And so that's what I got for you this morning. Hallelujah. And then one more as we close. Colossians 3.14, But above all these things put on love, which is the bond of perfection. 1 Peter 4.8, Above all these things have fervent love for one another. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> there is nothing in your life more important than the love of God. I'm talking about love coming to you and love going through you. Your happiness this morning is based on how much love is going through you. It's not based on how much stuff you have. It's not based on how many of your bills are paid. It's not based on any of those things. It's based on how much love is flowing through you. Amen. When you're walking in love, you're happy. Yes, sir. yes, you are. You're happy when you're walking in love. And that's why Jesus said it's more blessed to give than receive. When you get on the give... You are not allowing fear to dominate your life. And I'm talking about giving, I'm talking about more than finances. I'm talking about giving of yourself. Can I get an amen? amen. But when, we are, when we've let our love walk go, and we've got so afraid and so fearful, and that we're not walking in love anymore, how many know you're not happy? Because fear is dominating your life instead of love dominating your life. Amen? And so certainly we understand that number one, it's God's love for us, but then number two, it's our love for each other and our love for God. A love-soaked life is a happy life. Amen. It's a happy life. And sometimes you got to 
uh, God will, 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 will just kind of snap you out of your pity party and get you to do something for somebody besides yourself. <laughs> you ever notice that? Somebody that might not be able to do anything in return for you. Somebody that, that might no one even know about. But as you uh, get on, just allow love to come forth in your life, it, it, it reminds you of why you're on earth. Amen? All right, let's, let's stand up so I can shut up. Because I can't stop. <laughs> Amen.